Hi, I'm Anna Wagoner and welcome to Carpe Artista's new instructor spotlight. We have such a cool instructor that we're talking to today. His name is Steve Bowman. Thank you so much for joining us, Steve. He was one of the founding members of Counting Crows. He's played with many other bands as well. He's been a session musician and now he is one of the instructors at Carpe. So hi, Steve. How are you? Very well. Thank you, Anna. Thanks Thank for speaking with me today. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I think that um, the kids you're teaching are so lucky to be able to learn from someone who's been a professional musician for years. Well, you know, uh, you can learn lots of basics and drumming from, from anybody. And, and so what I hope is after 30 years of experience, what I can add is, uh, you know, I always say trying to save time, uh, money or effort off the process is uh, what I can do, uh, you know, uh, people always say, I wish I'd known when I was 18, you know, well, if I can work with young players and, and maybe convey some of the stuff that I learned in my process, I'd be happy to do that. That is so, so cool. So um, what made you interesting in learning how to play drums? How old were you when you first got into that? I was probably, you know, when I was like five years old, I, I saw a drummer at a county fair <laughs> And, and it was all I could uh, uh, do the rest of the day is just like watch this drummer or convince my family to take me back to where the stage was. And uh, I was really so uh, interested in the, uh, the sound and the sparkles. And, and you know, it's, I, I always say I don't know why every uh, five to 10 year old uh, boy or girl wouldn't be a drummer because it's, <laughs> it's everything in one. But uh, I really, it was like uh, uh, an instant love for this uh, uh, this loud, sparkly thing. And I got some drumsticks pretty early on. And I, I really can't take credit for it, but I was always really interested in playing. I, I loved rudiments and I loved, uh, I got a drum set early on and I just, it's all I wanted to do, you know? So uh, uh, yeah, real early on and uh uh, what can I say? Here we are. Uh, I'm in my 50s now and I still love playing. Right. It seemed to work out for you as well, yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been playing drums since you were basically five or interested in it since you were basically five. Um, you were the original drummer and one of the founding members for Counting Crows. Talk to me a little bit about starting that band and what it was like just making music with them. Well, you know, I was very, it was, I was young and, uh, and I didn't even know how good it was until I started doing other things and thought, wow, I love how we used to do that with Counting Crows. We'd, you know, on stage or, or in writing and, and, uh, you know, you start with great songwriters and Adam and Dave, uh, you know, wrote most of the songs for the first record, all the songs, for the first record. And, uh, you know, when you start with amazing songwriting, it's so much easier to do your part <laughs> because right. as a drummer, um, uh, I was inspired uh, by the lyrics and, and where the progression was going. And so, oh, really? Well, yeah, I, okay. so it was real easy for me to do the right thing because I was writing a feeling, you know, as opposed to imagining what would sound good or, or uh, you know, what I think I should do as a drummer. And, uh, and I found that uh, that happens with great songwriters, but, but there's not as many great songwriters <laughs> as there are uh, opportunities to play drums. And so sometimes uh, I would find myself thinking, wow, uh, live especially, Adam is a very uh, dynamic performer mm -hmm. and he would bring us up and down with an arm motion. And, oh, okay. Uh, and the band was all so in tune to playing parts and to listening that we could go in directions live uh, up and down and, and stop and start. And uh, we played so much uh, that it got to a point where we could really uh, create in the middle of a song. Even things you'd never done before, you could do them live because you've been playing yeah. together so long. Yeah, you know, I, I had a friend who was playing uh, drums with, with uh, Tracy Chapman who's an artist from the 90s amazing and, and he said they went on a tour once and she said 
I don't want to play the, the songs the same way twice. Every night I want it to be different. That's really hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> so like, you know, like throw a reggae feel onto a song everybody knows. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. it doesn't have a reggae. And so that type of uh, creativity uh, live is, is really amazing if you get a chance to do it and really hard to pull off unless you have people that are listening and playing parts and uh, trying to achieve something greater than, you know, like Definitely. the sum being greater than the, the parts. So. But that probably makes it more interesting for the performer and the listener to hear it like, oh, that's different than they did it on the record, you know? Well, yeah. And, you know, certain songs, maybe you want to stick, you know, if you're playing Mr. Jones, they might want to keep that like right. it is. <laughs> Don't but, mess with the classics that they love. Well, on. yeah. But some songs really lend themselves to uh, maybe a long intro or, a, or an outro or a, something in the middle. And, and, uh, and so what I found is that not every band does that. And uh, Right, no, they you know, don't. We came to Nashville in, in 2006 and I started doing more country work. And, uh, and uh, sometimes, you know, those uh, sets, it's right down the line. There's mm -hmm. a set list and click tracks and uh, lighting cues that <laughs> are, you know, and that's, that's fine. That's entertainment, yeah. but, uh, uh, and it's a way to make a living, but it was very different. And uh, so, and I didn't really know that when I was in Cat and Crows, I just thought, yeah, this is great. Uh, you just thought that was how kind of everybody. I thought that's how we were all going to do it the rest of my career. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> That's uh, so um, did you help with the songwriting process in any of the songs as well? I saw your name credited on one of the tracks. Yeah, you know, uh, the band was very fair with splitting up uh, royalties. Okay. Uh, at that time, we had seen, we'd had some other friends that put out records and maybe had a hit and found themselves in situations where like one or two people were splitting uh, were, you're like buying houses and the other guys were <laughs> you know right. were trying to hoping the band would go on tour again so they could make money uh, and so Counting Crows uh, Adam was astute enough to uh, figure out ways to incorporate everybody in the songwriting so okay. that we all had a piece of of that part of the business that's and really really like, nice because that's a very lucrative part of the business so for that to really include is. you we call it mailbox money to get yes. royalties and you know that's kind of uh, how you how you end up making a living because if you can get some wind behind your sails then you can do things and maybe things that aren't as lucrative or or don't make any money for a while because <laughs> you have some backup but uh yeah and and there was one song that i was credited with uh because we kind of wrote it at a rehearsal mm. um before Adam even, or Dave, or I think it was Matt Malley, the bassist and I started playing a groove that people kind of showed up to this rehearsal and joined in on, and it became a song. Okay. And, uh, it did that, but we had an interesting way of cutting up even songs that were written before, you know, uh, I got there. Uh, there was a way to uh, incorporate band members uh, into that situation, and so. Okay. Gotcha. So I'm, I mean, to this day, August and everything after uh, is, you know, uh, uh, allows me to, to uh, you know, not to work 40 hours a week. At a <laughs> oh, that is really, really cool that even today you still get that mailbox money. Yeah. And also I'm lucky because it's the kind of record that uh, singer songwriters still want to hear and they kind of pass on to mm -hmm. other singer songwriters oh yeah uh, so because and you know like i can't take any credit for incredible songwriting i can only take credit for knowing there was some incredible songwriting and then being a part of it you know right it's it's such a cool record and uh so you were with them through that entire record were you still with the band when mr jones was like hitting it huge on radio airplay yeah. Very cool. Okay. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And, and we toured that record for a couple of years. And, oh, okay. Uh, and so it was after the touring cycle uh, that I left. And, and also nothing happened with Counting Crows for three years after that. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Adam uh, 
has been pretty uh, uh, open about some some problems he was having psychologically. He wanted to take some time off and clear his head out. And so, uh, so they took a break for three years. And then I went on and started doing Third Eye Blind <laughs> right after that. And uh, that was a completely different thing. And uh, I did that for about seven months and then, uh, you know, decided to clear my own head out for a while. And uh, uh, so I, I started doing sessions in the Bay Area. And instead of playing in bands for a while, I was really just interested in recording mm -hmm. and subbing for folks and doing non-musical things. I got real into books and I was like, oh, okay. finding, uh, looking for uh, rare books all over the place and reading a lot and finding authors and like devouring their whole, you know, everything they've ever written. So, uh, so I was doing all kinds of different things. I, right now I'm, I'm re I love disc golf. Oh, cool. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, that I, have uh. that, uh, I spend a lot of time. So, always doing different things but I think that actually helps your musicality to uh, infuse different uh, uh, parts of life for sure yeah with um with third eye blind were you a session musician or a fill-in or were you an actual like were you a member I was a band member for about okay. seven months very uh, cool yeah it was um you know those guys are real rock stars and and uh, I was a little gun shy of of uh, you know I was I wasn't as wild at that point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, wild by Counting Crows standards, but not by those standards. And also, you know, Counting Crows, uh, thanks to Mr. Jones and all that, you know, I had a little money in the bank and, and didn't have to uh, do something. I didn't feel it was for me. So, um, but yeah, I went on to do a lot of different things and, and uh, a lot of different tours and and records and and i've just i feel so lucky you know uh, mm -hmm. here we are all these years later and, and that brings us to cafe artista <laughs> absolutely yes and before we talk about Caf uh artista i just want to i was wondering you've worked with a ton of different bands um being in the bands and being a session musician what is it about an artist that makes you want to work with them? Like, is there some sort of common denominator in all these artists that you've worked with or been a part of the band? Well, I'm always looking for great songs. I'm looking for songs that uh, energize me or break my heart or, you know, uh, if I'm driving the car and I realize I'm doing 80, I know that's a good sign. It's like, oh, okay. You know, uh, and it's really um, songs that I, that I gravitate towards okay. um and and of course uh you know uh artists that have amazing voices are fun to work with you know uh, absolutely uh, and i've been lucky to to play with some of those uh, uh here and there but yeah i guess it's always songs okay like where i'm at now i feel like um uh i'm i'm much more uh comfortable uh, not being in the spotlight or, or not being in worrying about uh, where a record is placed and, and where it's, you know. Just uh, if you like it. Man, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and and, uh, and maybe it means that I'll do more teaching than play. Yeah. Um, or so, maybe, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll find some uh, young artists and, and help them uh, to be successful. So, Absolutely. So what, yeah, what made you want to become a drum instructor? How'd you get involved with Carpe? Well, I've been teaching in different ways for a long time. I wrote a book called Groove Control on, oh, okay. groove, on drum technique. And when I did that, that was 2006, I started getting into doing uh, clinics for uh, some of the uh, uh, endorse, endorsers I was working for, um, Aquarian and Vic Firth and, and I was doing uh, different clinics uh, for like large groups and band camps and master classes and stuff. And um, at a certain point, a friend of mine had a gig, he was doing the Lion King in San Francisco and he had 30 drum students. And when he got this gig, he was like, do you wanna take these students on? And, <laughs> the, and it, the plan was if the show doesn't work, 
then he can come grab him back and I'll walk away. And so the show was a big hit and I ended up teaching those students for like two years. Oh, cool. And, and all of a sudden I'm like, geez, I'm teaching, I'm doing these, you know, uh, clinics and teaching 30 students a week. I'm like a drum teacher. Uh, <laughs> it just happened. Yeah. Uh, but that was actually a long time ago. And I did a bunch of stuff, uh, non teaching related. Uh, and then started getting back into it a couple of years ago and uh, uh, just doing online stuff. People that I'd taught before might call me, we do one lesson or oh, you know, okay. an hour. And I just try to give them so much stuff that they have two months to work on it. They call it back and and then when we moved to Murfreesboro uh, this year, um, I, when looking for a house, I decided I was going to look for one that I could make a teaching studio in. And this house happens to have right off, as you walk in the front door, right to the right is this perfect carpeted room. I have two drum sets, a keyboard, a bass on the wall, all kinds of stuff. And having a great time here and that is my personal teaching studio uh which is uh separate than uh okay. um and so um i was at that point when the pandemic kind of was rolling along and i didn't really feel like having students in the house anyway yeah. <laughs> and so, uh but but around that time i ran into a, a friend that introduced me to ron alley mm -hmm. and uh and I loved what they were doing there. And so uh, I love the idea also of uh, different types of, of art, uh, you know, music and acting and everything painting. there, visual, yeah. Yeah, and so it just seems like what a healthy place to be walking into. I'm just gonna do a couple days a week and try to fill both days uh, with, uh, with as many uh, drum students as we can jam in there and, uh, and then eventually I want to get into doing other stuff because they have the uh, facilities to do uh, classes. Um, I love the Cajon. I don't know if you're familiar with the Cajon. Yeah. Um, maybe explain what the Cajon is for, for people who don't. Well, it's basically a wooden box that you sit on and play like bongos. And like, it's acoustic, sound like acoustic drums, sort of. Yeah. But yeah. Well, it's, you know, it, you're, you, the ability to make it sound like a drum set is what I love because unlike like a djembe that's kind of Middle Eastern or, or a kunga, which is more, uh, you know, Latin American, this you can make sound like Led Zeppelin, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like hitting it the right way. And it's the kind of thing anyone who's ever tapped on their steering wheel or their, you know, dinner table can play. Mm -hmm. and so I talked to Ron about maybe getting a class together, getting some people out there, doing it for therapy, for for a community, for all kinds of things. That'd be really cool. Yeah. And of course, you could also do the same thing with young drummers, bassists, keyboardists, getting people together and, and doing a class on grooving or feel or time, you know. Because that's so important. That would be really, really cool. Yeah. Or the things we were talking about earlier, listening and parts and all this, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the sky's the limit down there and I'm excited to get in there and see what we can do and, and see what kind of fun we can have. The Carpe is such a cool company and, you know, music teachers are just, they're so important. And I remember almost every music teacher I've had from like my first guitar instructor, or like the guy who taught me piano in high school. Is there a, a music instructor that you had growing up that stands out to you that you remember? Oh, uh, like you, I remember every one. Yeah, uh, for sure. I feel like to mention one would have me smack in my head that <laughs> okay, I didn't yeah. remember one. But is it uh, interesting to think like kids are going to think of you like that? Like, oh, he was my first drum instructor, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, it's funny because I've had some, some emails in the last few years from students that I had when I took over my friend's students, like this was 20 years ago now. 10, 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, had a couple letters from, from folks that are now doing it, you know, and they're so making cool. a living and they're teaching and it's it's really gratifying and, and humbling and and scary because you think, oh my God, did I get them, did I tell them everything? <laughs> did I mess them up? Did I <laughs> sure, it was fine. Them? Are they going to call me later and go, oh man, you never told me yet. And so, <laughs> but, it, you know, it, it's exciting and, and uh, Already down at Carpe Artista, I had a student come in and he's talking about 
all my favorite drummers. And he's, he's only been playing a, a little while, but the names he's mentioning, the things he's interested in, I'm just like, this is right in my wheelhouse. So like, I'm, you know, I find myself driving, I'm thinking, all right, I, I should be, what can I do for this guy? What kind of lessons can I think of? It already, you know, I'm getting this. So I don't know. Uh, we'll see what happens. I, I know it's going to be fun and, and uh, I don't know what we're going to do there, but uh, something's going to happen and it's going to be great. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Um, I just have a couple more questions for you and then I will let you go. But um, what I just want to know what the best piece of advice you've been given as either a drummer or just a music professional musician in general. That really I'll tell you, you one out. thing that uh, changed me as a player. Um, I was uh, I was raised uh, drumming in an era with drum machines, and so right. I kind of came up thinking the way that you had to do this was to be perfect and hit hard, and and every note had to be exactly like the last one, and and in fact it did back then, and, <laughs> and so <laughs> so I got. It's a little technical, but I think you can get it. Uh, and I think people listening will get it. Um, I was only hitting at 10 for a while. And so it meant that if I wanted to back down on my dynamics, instead of hitting softer on the two and four, I would take out the two and just put in the four. So, oh. yeah. so, uh, so what it created was a, a different way to control the dynamics, but it meant that everything was epic, right? And I was doing a session for a guy and it didn't sound good. The song didn't call for epic and I didn't know how to draw it down. And what he said to me was, he said, hey, Steve, it's just a little song. <laughs> and I went in there and I thought, well, how would I play this if it was just a little song? <laughs> it sounded perfect. And it worked out, okay, good. Yes. Very cool. And, and the lesson was, um, I didn't, I didn't, I had these, this rule book about how a drummer had to hit a certain way. And, mm -hmm. and it turns out by opening my ears and listening, it was real easy to fit in the way that, it, that I needed to. I just had to switch off my um, preconceived notions about what was supposed to happen. Gotcha. And, because I guess I thought, well, if I go in there and play it like it's just a little song, he's going to think, well, what am I paying this guy for? <laughs> yeah. He's not dynamic. He's not into it. Right. But in reality, sometimes that works better. It worked perfectly. That is so cool. And um, I also just want to know, finally, for your students watching or just any musician watching, if you have any advice for anyone who would like to be a professional musician. Yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of different things you could tell somebody depending on where they are and what they're interested in and their uh, aspirations. Um, so it would be tough to to give a general answer across the board to that. Um, but I I guess I uh, if I could if I had to be general. Um, uh, because there's a lot of different styles of music too. Absolutely, you know? yeah. So, but, but for what I do, I love pop music, right? I love, um, you know, I'm lucky because pop is short for popular. Yes. <laughs> that means more people buy it. And so, I mean, I love Taylor Swift. Mm -hmm. So that's great because if you're involved with that, you make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, and for you sure. Make a good living and you can do a second record. Uh, but again, I can take no credit for that. Uh, but but I love pop music. And what I think is most important about pop music is understanding that every song has a point of view. The singer is singing about something. Uh -huh. And that something normally has a feeling attached, be it lost love or we're driving to the beach in our convertible. There's, there's a feeling to every song. And if you can feel that feeling while you're playing the song or while you're comprising a part or dialing in a tone, um, it makes it much easier to hit the mark. And it also, uh, as a drummer, when a singer songwriter feels like 
you're accentuating the lyric with your playing, they want to hire you again and again. That makes <laughs> even, sense, yeah. Even if they don't know why, they just, <laughs> like, man, it just, I, I sing it better when this person plays with me. So, gotcha. So I guess if I could give some general advice to pop music, it's something that we don't always work on. Uh, you know, we work on rudiments and our this and that and the scales, but but actually feeling like you do when you watch a movie or read a book or have a conversation with somebody, you know, uh, if you can do that while you're playing, mm -hmm. it kind of does everything for you. You just have to kind of swing your arms <laughs> in the way that that feeling dictates. That was you know? really good general advice. That was really, really interesting. I thought that was great. <laughs> <laughs> good got lucky well thank you so much for speaking with me steve it has been so fascinating and again steve is a new drum instructor with carpe artista if you are a drummer or would like to become a drummer and take lessons with steve so thank you so much for watching this carpe artista new instructor spotlight